and welcome to another episode of BitNote. We'll be talking about video games and talk and video game music. And this episode, I'll be tackling a game that's come up a few times before, but I've never really gone into fully. Portal 2, and we'll be playing some of the great music from it. So let's start off with the main theme, so to speak, of Portal, which is called Music of the Spheres. So uh, have a listen, and we'll get right into all about why this is such a well-known music track. Thank you very much, and hope you enjoy, and have a listen. And that was Music of the Spheres. It was from the soundtrack, of course, of Portal 2 by Mike Moraski. So, what is Portal 2, in case you don't know? Well, I've mentioned already the its prequel, of course, Portal. But basically, it's about one woman's struggle to actually break out of this insane testing facility where she is a test subject... Which seems to be over, which seem to be ruled over by some maniacal, utterly psychotic computer. The first game has it all pretty standard. You wake up in the test center and have to do a huge series of arbitrary tests involving this strange portal gun that basically lets you 
Well, for, uh, the portal mechanics are a little tricky to explain without the use of diagrams, but essentially it lets you put one opening on a wall right beside you and another opening on a wall across a, uh, that's a far distance away, and then you could just step through the portal. It basically, it's a portal gun that creates portals. So it's like wormholes or little very fast ways of like making doors that, that have one side that opens right beside you and another do- side of the door open a far distance away. So you go through this testing facility having to test out this portal gun in a wide variety of crazy ways before you finally realize that things are getting way too insane. The computer tries to kill you and you're desperately trying to just break out and just finally end up confronting the computer and continuing on. In a somewhat controversial thing, the uh, first game actually had its ending changed. It ended originally where, you know, after a whole lot of destruction, you wake to find yourself finally... Everything was happening underground, by the way. You wake to finally find yourself outside in the sunshine looking at the aperture, looking at the science lab from the outside, and you're happy that where whatever happened, you had this moment being released. But then they released a software update that actually changed this, so now that suddenly, if you played it back when it came out, you would have felt you'd been released, but then suddenly they changed it to add this ending where suddenly you were recaptured at the end of it, which is kind of crazy. It, it's not unusual to change games after they've been released using with patches, but that's normally to actually remove bugs, not to actually change the entire narrative of it. So essentially, Portal 2 has you waking up yet again, trapped in the same science facility. The twist is that instead of it, it seems that the maniacal computer has been defeated, and also it seems to be thousands of, well, a huge, huge amount of time in the future. You apparently were spending the time in suspended animation, and on top of that, it looks like um, the whole place has been completely overgrown, abandoned, and you're basically going through what's basically an echo of what has happened. To add things to it, you've got this rather idiotic computer who speaks with a British accent and is happily trying to tell you everything that they need to do in order to get out of here. Although whether you trust him to know what the heck he's doing is completely another situation entirely, but that kind of gets a lot of rapport going early on in the game as you make your way through the same overgrown test facilities that you you know saw the previous time and end up going on this whole journey that will take you to, through crazy parts of the facility. And yes, the maniacal computer will finally make a reappearance because it was that that would be spoiling it but let's be honest it was she was never going to stay out of this for the whole time so um before i go into a little more about uh, what portal 2 does that really ups the ante and everything why don't i play some uh, more music now mike moransky moransky has done some uh, great music for both this and the last game of course he's the uh, composer at valve valve is the company that made portal 2 and uh, he's had quite an eclectic selection of music tunes for this one i'm going to play now the, the what i just played was music of the spheres which is the theme of the the game but right now i'll try playing you the die cut laser dance which i think has got a lot of really interesting uh it kind of just shows just uh, a bit of good example of some of the music in this game so have a listen Thank <laughs> you. 
And that was Die Cut Laser Dance from Portal 2, of course. That actually happens at an interesting part of the game. Basically, you literally get to see this gigantic sheets of metal metal pass you and then these huge industrial lasers actually cut out patterns in the metal sheets right in front of you portal 2 is a lot of that actually a lot of games work on the basic gameplay you go from one sequence to another but uh, sometimes like in and doom 3 did a lot of this there's some really nice like graphical effects like basically eye candy in order to show how it was happening one interesting part in the game is actually seeing how the portals are assembled but that's that's a whole other thing this game has popped up in this show a few times when i was a interviewing the the developer of Tesla, uh, Glenn Moran, he actually had us play Robots FTW, which is a track from the game. And also more recently, uh, Spencer Riedel, the composer in Charlotte Seeker, basically used Portal 2 as an example of how everything built itself up, how the music was actually a part of the experience. For instance, sometimes if you do these special things like, you know, bounce on this gel or whatever, it doesn't exactly create a sound effect as such. It more creates a musical accompaniment to the background track. And then as you gradually create puzzles, another layer is added to the music. So it actually makes the music interactive to how the puzzle is solved. And it basically has the whole atmosphere to how it's done. In a way, it, it fades into the background. That's actually a problem I have with a lot of games when I'm reviewing this on the show. I'm saying, what, that game? But did it actually have musical accompaniment? And the truth is, you know, the music usually fits in the game and so well that you actually have to pay attention to it. And that's what this game is this music show has had me do it's had me to actually pay attention to the music in the background and ruin them because now i'm actually well actually not really but it does show that you know if you're not listening for music you can just fade in subconsciously and it just affects how you appreciate it if you want any of the uh, tracks from this actually it's very easy to get valve have quite thankfully made the entire portal 2 album completely free to download on their portal 2 website that is awesome of them i have to say i mean it's just often i for some old games it's hard to even actually get the music from the game and sometimes you can buy it on a site like like bandcamp is great for this for downloading soundtracks but for valve to say like just have the entire album for free that is completely awesome as I said, the game is a puzzle game. You use Portal to get through the area, and it's fun. But there is actually one part of the game that I think actually is much better than the original and just hasn't done been done before. It is the uh, co-op function. So essentially with Portal 2, in the single player game, it's a lot like the uh, like the first game. You have all these puzzles, you have all these technical things to work through. You've got to lay down pu- portals and everything and try to figure out how all the systems interact with each other. And then there's that. Sometimes, for instance, the laser might be pointing at this wall. So you put a portal where the laser is being pointed and a portal somewhere else. So the laser suddenly comes out of a completely new location and then hopefully hits the sensor that'll trigger something else happening. So every time you're in a test area, you basically figure out where the exit is and figure out what sort of bizarre set of events you need to get in act in order to get yourself over to the test center. Where it's different is that there's also a co-op thing where essentially it's not just you going, there's actually you and a friend or someone you don't know suddenly find yourself both in the test chamber and you both have to work together to get out of it now i've always had a fondness for co-op co-op as being cooperative there was an arcade game like in the 90s called lucky and wild and the great thing about that was that it was a driving and shooting game at the same time so there were a lot of like arcade games where you'd shoot at the screen and there were a lot of arcade games where you drive with the steering wheel and pedals lucky and wild let you do both so you drove but you also shot at the screen while you were driving so what i'd often like to do is just play in a credit and then just get someone to you know either they'd drive and I'd shoot and it would be fun because you know we'd be both working together and having a lot of skills now there have been a lot of co-op games that have been developed recently I mean Valve themselves who made Portal 2 have also made like Left 4 Dead and Team Fortress 2 but the thing about both these games is that you don't really need to communicate with the other person at any point in Left 4 Dead 2 there are zombies coming at you it doesn't take a genius to say let's all shoot the zombies and while there's some areas that require you to cooperate a little bit more if you're relatively skillful player you can figure out what needs to be done take the role and do it the same thing happens with team fortress 2 for instance i mean there's the medic who will keep someone at health and then there's the heavy who takes a lot of damage so the genius is that if you're a medic you you heal the the heavy and if you're heavy you wait until a medic comes and there's a whole lot of actually team fortress 2 is fantastic for this because there's a whole lot of behaviors and strategies you generally learn and apply normally without cooperation so it's almost fascinating insight into into how even without communication how you can like cooperate with each other and develop stratagems and stuff but when it comes to portal 2 and the co-op 
And neither of those strategies are enough. You could do about a hundred random things, uh, both of you together, and it won't get you off the platform. You two are basically walking around this area. You're both able to leave a set of portals. So you've got basically four portals to leave down. But it, that's just not enough. You need to know how to actually leave put down the portals in the right way in the right sequence how to interact with the lasers and all the jumps and the bumps and all the cubes and everything and you know you actually have to cooperate with someone i managed to contact a friend i had online and uh you know we were both game for it it was very tricky to do it because if one person knows how to do all the puzzles already then of course it's it, the whole thing is spoiled so um for my first time doing this i had to choose someone who hadn't done it as well so we could work together and honestly it was it was great and um, we set up at first we communicate with text and it was tricky enough but um then we actually managed to get a voice call going and uh it's just that sort of cooperation i just love it because you're looking around you're thinking you might do something and the other person says wait a sec that gives me an idea or they might do something and you give it an idea and it also kind of teaches you about you know communicating with other people because maybe you've got an idea but the other person um just but um but the other person has a different idea so whose idea are you going to go for do you want to just disregard the other person and go for it which might annoy you but maybe gets which might annoy them but get the puzzle solved differently or do you want to actually um try to cooperate them if you think they're telling a terrible idea do you go along with it or do you try to force ahead your idea or then do you trust them and then it's this whole human interaction thing because you realize it's not just about solving the puzzle that's a really cool task to do it's also about getting on with the person so you can just push forward and hopefully complete the game with each other and um i've always liked this because as much as i've loved video games i love when games bring people together i love it when games get people interacting and talking and chatting and there were so many fun experiences for instance for instance, um, there's a way you can use portals in order. There are these things called light bridges, and essentially, you have this bridge going across. And so sometimes one of us would be walking across a bridge, and someone would move their portal, so the light bridge disappears. And suddenly, one of us accidentally causes the other to fall to their death. Obviously, this leads to some emotion. But then one time, uh, my friend was actually going across it, and I'll, I'll spare you the details, but he did something that accidentally made his own br- uh, portals disappear without him realizing it. And suddenly his bridge fell. He fell to his death and he just swore at me. I was like, dude, dude, it wasn't my fault. You did it yourself. And he said, oh, oh, I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it's just funny because when one of your friends accidentally dies in a video game, it's just, it's just, it's just all for the humor factor. <laughs> and that's what I like. Good games are good when they, when there's much fun, when things go wrong as when they do it right. And that's it. that's how it happened. We had to. There were a lot of things going there. The faith plates to bump you around. There's all this sort of stuff. And the old challenge is just trying to, you know, work with each other and have a fun time and have a fun experience. And we really did enjoy that. And then at one stage, we even had like a third guy join in, and I used desktop screening so he could see what we did. And um, my friend actually had an interesting thing though. Um, there were, we had a lot of portal turrets in the game. These are like sentient turrets that kill you and most of the time i destroy them but my friend kind of had an aversion to them being destroyed so if we could and you know we'd try to like move them so they like put them into the corner and face the corner so they wouldn't hit any it was it was kind of funny that way anyway i'm gonna play uh one more track from this this is a very interesting track that plays at a very interesting part in the game in the last game there was this part called um still alive which pretty much everyone knew and i played and it was a very fun song the, the game didn't have quite as memorable tracks but there is one bit of track and i think it's beautiful and it plays in a very unexpected part of the game i won't spoil anything and that's why i'm not playing the actual final track because that kind of does spoil things but i think this one is pretty amazing in its own regard so have a listen Thank you. 
And that was Cara Mia Adio by uh, Mick Moraski from Portal 2 by Valve. And uh, one other thing I mentioned about Portal 2 is that um, it also lets you make your own levels, which is a lot of fun. I made a level that just let me portal around doing crazy stuff. At one point, I had this spring that shot a cube through one of my portals, then it came out another portal, and it lands on the spring, so it sprang right back through the first portal. And it continues being springing up around, hit the spring again, spring again, and I just watched it and laughed. So, fun times. On to my next track, and what will be the last track. Yes, I actually do manage to have a little bit of time for something else here. I try to uh, play and preferably try to complete every video game before I actually play the music on this show. Sometimes this is not possible. Um, sometimes it's because I played the game a while back, and sometimes because the game was hard and I never quite finished it, and trying to start all the way again would be a bit too much trouble. But sometimes it's because the game in question is Shadow of the Beast, the Mega Drive r- version, by Reflections Interactive. The reason why Shadow of the Beast is an exception is a problem is quite simply this. I start Shadow of the Beast. I actually read the instruction manual. I had a very interesting story. It's about a slave who suddenly fights for the freedom and all this sort of stuff. And I mean, I really loved how it was written in the instruction manual. It reminded me a bit of Red Fraction, actually. Brilliant instruction manual writing. But when I actually started the game, it didn't seem to match up. When I played Shadow of the Beast, I saw this whole thing about a slave getting freedom. I started the game. I was a guy in a field. I had two options as a my newly emancipated slave I could either run left or I could run right if I ran left I found this well if I went down the well and I couldn't go any fur- I couldn't go any further left I had to go down the well at that point I'd find myself in a great big cavern sort of thing which I struggled around I'd punch monsters and go up until finally I found myself in this area where basically this gigantic bone monstrosity vehicle was heading towards me like a wall of doom um I didn't know what to do. If I ran in the other direction, I hit into a wall, and the Doom monster vehicle thing would crash into me and kill me instantly. And if I tried to punch it, I might get one hit before suddenly it would crush into me anyway. I looked at the back of the uh, box manual, and I apparently saw that my character had some sort of, you know, power pellet punch thing that would shoot these projectiles across at the thing but I had no idea how to actually instantiate this. So every time I went, got to that area, I struggled through it to get to that area, I would either get crushed by that thing one way or the other. What's more is, unfortunately, this was the, um, that this did not have continues or anything. You die once, you lost the entire, you had to start again all the way from the beginning. Back in the field, back in walking left across the field, back down the well, back through the cavern, all the way back to that gigantic monstrosity heading towards me to try to figure out once again how to defeat this thing and in the five ten maybe ten seconds it took to have a shot at actually trying to figure this thing i would die and if i tried to punch it i might get like i said one hit it would kill me i'd die so that's what happened if i went left if i went right oh boy For a start, I would walk across this gigantic plain. It would take ages. Everything would try to kill me. There would be rocks that would come out of things for no reason. I mean, why the heck were they rocks? There'd be bats. And scarily enough, gigantic skeleton hands, larger than the size of me, would suddenly come out of the ground, reach up, like snap their fingers. I don't know what they did. That's how I always remembered it. They were snapping their fingers. Probably not what happened. They would snap their fingers descend back into the earth and keep doing it so it was a gauntlet everything was trying to kill me i would just be walking across green plain trying to take as least damage as possible by shooting all these by hitting punching killing all these things finally i'd get to a castle i'd go into the castle and i would say oh wait a second you know um it's too dark and if i went too far the screen would black out and i would have to go back unless i wanted to take my chances which would probably get me killed fortunately when i went out of the castle i would see a torch fully lit on the outside of the castle so apparently they have fully lit torches on the outside of castles during daytime I'd jump up and grab the torch, go back in and that was solved, so hurrah, some things in this game were easy, so then I would go down I'd start navigating the castle, but I'd be already on low health from traversing the gigantic plane and then I'd get killed again and that would be what happened. And I tried it a few times. Sometimes I could try it so I had more health. But that castle was too chaotic and I would die. And that would have happened if I went right. So um, that's pretty much how the game left for me. I'd go left to get killed by a crush thing. Go right to get killed while either trying to traverse a plane while everything was... Well, all these random things were trying to kill me. And finally get to a castle where I'd spend the last time being with one basic puzzle and then end up being killed by whatever happened there as you can imagine i never did finish that game and um i never looked favorably on that game either 
while looking up to get some details about the game, I discovered that Shadow of the Beast actually had two sequels. It was mainly for the Amiga. And indeed, there is a PlayStation 4 remake that is apparently on the way. So good things to the franchise and good things to the people who like this game but it'll be forever remembered as this game where no matter what I, whether i went left or right i would eventually get killed and have to start over again and yes so i should give it some credit the music was by david whitaker and uh, it is actually pretty good so um this uh, what i will play now is the tune that i heard constantly played as i made my way across that plane it is called uh, it is called Arabon's Revenge, apparently named after the main protagonist, emancipated slave called Arabon. And um, I think I will listen to you. And as you listen to it, you can either appreciate it for the music or think about how much pain this game caused me. This has been David Collins with BitNote. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. 